something needs to be done right now, well, they don't want less quality, do they? They want the same quality, but they just want it a little quicker. In 1 Thessalonians, I really see, have a, see a sense of urgency that the Apostle Paul has. And I wondered, as I was looking at this passage in particular, I, I was wondering, I wonder if Paul's emphasis on the Lord's coming throughout this, this whole book, I wonder if that maybe is somewhat of the urgency that he might have. He has in mind the Lord's coming, the Lord's coming. And then as I got looking at the, this passage here, and you have these short little statements. Some of these statements and some of these challenges that he gives us here, they're just two words in the Greek text. And so we have this, but I, why didn't he explain a little more? But I think there's a sense of urgency and maybe maybe expedite is a good word that, that uh, just sticks with me. And so let's just look at what Paul has to say in these verses beginning, we're going to back up to verse 12. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, going back to verse 12. My Bible even heads it up, various exhortations. Well, how do you make a sermon out of that? And uh, that's a challenge. Verse 12, and we urge you, brethren, to recognize those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. Be at peace among yourselves. Now, verse 14, our text, now we exhort you, brethren, warn those who are unruly, comfort the faint-hearted, uphold the weak, be patient with all. See that no one renders evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good, both for yourselves and for all. And we'll stop there today, and we're really looking at verses 14 and 15 in, as our text. And one of the first things Paul does, as you notice, my translation is, we urge you. I think the, the old King James says, we exhort you. And this, con this common, common word that we have in this text, uh, used throughout the scripture, it comes from the, the two Greek words, call beside, so there's that, that sense of, that sense of nearness, and I think that's gonna come out even as we go on. And sometimes this word is translated comfort. And uh, we have, we, God calls himself the God of all comfort in 2 Corinthians chapter one. I often read that passage when we, when we have a funeral message. The God of all comfort. We know that God uh, calls us to his side. We can have that sense of comfort. Then the word is sometimes translated encourage. And in fact, it wouldn't surprise me if, in my mind, that's the first word I think of, encourage. That's why I put it in my title. But that sense of encouragement. Uh, I call you to my side to encourage you, that kind of an idea. And then, uh, as the old King James said, exhort. I think that's a little more punch, a little more powerful. But uh, in, the, in, in the Greek mind, as they would look at this word, they would know that it fits all of those ideas. It has a, it's a pretty broad word, and it has some, has some tenderness, it has some power to it, and, and I, I think as we look at this context, there's this sense of encouraging them along the way. Now, if I would ask you, uh, I would ask you about encouragement in your life, and by the way, I think we all need encouragement, and we all thrive on encouragement. You know, no matter, there are just certain ways and certain ways that might speak to us greater. But what about encouragement at work? If you get encouragement at work, well, what is it? Well, some of you would say, a bigger paycheck, you know, or some might say it's the attitude or the atmosphere of work or, or that kind of a thing. Some of it may be just your aptitude toward work. That's where you might find encouragement doing what you're meant to do. Uh, so what, how about family? How do you find encouragement in family? Well, it's probably the, that sense of belonging, that closeness, that, that, uh, that unconditional love that family has for each other. Uh, there was a, a psychologist, and I'm not even going to try to say his name, but he said one of the most important skills for raising a child in these days is the ability to encourage that child. That's interesting. Ability to encourage. And of course, there's way more to child rearing than that, but encouragement it might take many forms. I'll just leave it at that. 
Uh, some, some people will take note about encouragement and they talk about the difference between praise and encouragement. And I, I noted that uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of the entries on the internet when they were talking about this idea, they talked about educators. How do you teachers get through to the kid? How do you do this? And uh, I think years ago there was the idea the focus was on, on praise because they were so worried about self-esteem. Whereas now they're seeing, well, encouragement really builds up something in a reality type way. And I'll, I'll read a quote for you. It says, whereas praise is given only when one achieves good results, encouragement can be given anytime, even when things go poorly. And I first thing I thought about is uh, a, a kid on the, on the baseball diamond, you know. <clears throat> oh, it was a miss. But it was a good swing. You know, you can encourage them with, man, that was a great swing. Next time, put your eye on the ball, but, uh, or whatever. You know, there could be all sorts of things, and, and uh, encouragement can still come even when things don't go poorly. Uh, you know, whereas praise, oh, you, you didn't hit a home run today. Uh, you know, you're, so I can't praise you? No. Encouragement along those lines. I think uh, Edison was a perfect example of someone who understood, understood the difference. Uh, he, when he said, I've not failed, I've just found 10,000 ways it won't work. You know, how many of you would give up after 9,999? 9, you know, how many of us would have given up? Well, Edison, Edison had another statement. He said, many of life's failures, failures are people who do not realize how close they were to success when they gave up. Interesting, isn't it? So in our context here, the encouragement is a primary thing. He, Paul begins this statement in verse, in verse uh, 14, or yeah, in verse 14, now we exhort you, we urge you, we encourage you. So he uses that idea, now we exhort you, brethren. And so when, but it's on a spiritual plane. What encourages you spiritually? You ever stop and think of that? What really encourages you in the spiritual realm? What's interesting is that Paul did something, and Paul did something here to bring across encouragement. He, he combines in this context something kind of unique. He begins with an encouragement, and then he takes it over to the idea of commands. And I, he doesn't do that very often in any other place in the scripture. But he says, we encourage you. And then he gives us a series of commands. And he's talking to the same people because he says, you and brethren. He says, we encourage you and you are the brothers who are supposed to follow through with this encouragement. One's a direct object, the other's the subject of the next sentence. So... But let me, let me stop a little bit when we, when we think about brethren. As Paul says, Paul's addressing these guys, he, he's addressing them as brethren, as people in the family of God. He's not just, he's just not throwing this out here for the general population of people who don't know Christ. It's for people who are a, mem are a member of the body of Christ, are members of the, of the family of God. Too often, too often in our religion-filled world, people think in terms of doing something, of producing something to make themselves a member of the family of God, rather than depending upon what Jesus Christ has done in providing our salvation. And I think a lot of times that's confused when you get to a passage like this that says, that, in, that gives us commands, well, do this and do this and do this. And so people think, oh, if I do that, I will be a Christian. Rather than realizing our salvation and our service are two different things. Our salvation and service are, are not the same. We don't, we, don't, we don't try to please God to get saved. We please God because we are saved. We don't serve God to get saved. We serve God because we are saved. We, we stand upon that foundation of, of salvation in order to serve, in order to please God. 
And I think Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10 is a great example of that. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 talks about salvation. For by grace... You have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. It's not of works, lest anyone should boast. And we often emphasize that with salvation. And I, I, and I, I surely don't want anyone to leave here today without realizing that, that our salvation is solid and secure in Christ by grace and by faith. It is by grace through faith. Then verse 10 goes on to say, so if you were reading that as a believer in Ephesus, if you were reading that, you'd go right on to verse 10. For we, who's we? We the ones that are saved. For we are his workmanship, his craftsmanship. In other words, God made us. God saved us, made us, put, to, put us together as believers in the family of God as those who are to we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. See, he denied good works over in verses 8 and 9 for salvation. But he says, once you are saved, you're created for good works. You're designed for good works, which God has preplanned. That's my abbreviated version. God has a plan for you as a believer. But don't confuse salvation and service. Trust Jesus Christ, you have eternal life. Live for Him and you please Him. Don't mix the two. So, Paul does this unique thing. I encourage you, brethren. I encourage you. Now, brethren, warn, point number two, command number one. Warn the unruly. The word for warn literally means place in the mind. Oftentimes it's translated admonish in the scriptures, the idea of admonish. But let's leave it with the idea of warning. But warning, you've got to get it in their mind. Take for example, example the Old Testament. Take Jonah for example. What did Jonah do? Jonah preached the greatest revival of all human history, I think. He preached the greatest revival, a city that was huge, and Jonah, Jonah's simple message was to repent or you guys are going to get wiped out. I mean, simple, simple message that, that God had Jonah proclaim, and there's way more than that. They did, and God didn't. You know, they repented, and God didn't wipe them out, and, uh, but, and, but we'll just leave it at that. It was a warning. Uh, other warnings. Look at the warning back in, with Adam and Eve. Don't eat of the fruit or you're going to die. Hmm. Here's a, that's pretty stern, isn't it? That's as, it's as stern as, uh, as uh, Jonah's warning. If you guys don't repent, you're going to get wiped out. If you eat of the fruit, you're going to die. And guess what? We've been dying ever since. They began their spiritual death. We are born in sin. And uh, anyway. Uh, other, other situations. Uh, not too long ago, we touched on Peter's warning about Satan being a roaring lion looking for who he might devour. That's a warning. Sometimes warning come, warnings come in other ways. Uh, uh, just the warning for children, obey your parents. And uh, it goes on and it talks about because it'll be well with you. And in other words, you'll, uh, you'll have long life, etc., quoting the Old Testament. And, well, you think, was that a warning? Yeah, it is. You turn around, disobedience equals short life. I mean, you have just the opposite is true. And so sometimes warnings comes in, come in all different ways. And so when he says, warn the unruly, how many of you thought that meant you? <laughs> yeah, none of us did, did we? We really didn't think, well, he's not talking to me here. Warn the unruly. Maybe you thought of an unruly person you wanted to talk, you wanted to warn. But, you know, most of us, you know, here's this short little statement here. And that's what's the challenge of these, these short little statements. What does this have to do with anything? Well, turn over to chapter 3 of 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Just turn over there quickly. And because you have the verb form of this word over here used a few times. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. And you have this verb type idea of, of what the unruly are. And uh, I'm going to summarize them that they are bums. Okay? I'm just going to leave it. I'll just say bums. What is the problem? 
notice, uh, and notice what he tells us to do. Verse 6. But we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you re withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly. The word disorderly is the same, same construction, same basic Greek word, only in verb form or adverb form. He walks disorderly and not according to the tradition which he received from us. Well, tradition received from Paul, that's God's revelation. That's God's word. Verse 7, for you yourselves know how you ought to follow us, for we were not disorderly, same word, among you. Nor did we eat anyone's bread free of charge, but worked with labor and toil night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. We know Paul did that, and here we are. We're talking to the same people, the Thessalonian people, and he's talking about them and how they, how, how Paul's example among them was that he was willing to work for the, so that they would not... Uh, think that they had to pay for the gospel, as I think is a big picture. Verse 9, not because we do not have authority, but we make ourselves an example of how you should follow us, even when we were with you. We commanded you this, if anyone will not work, neither should he eat. For we hear there are some who walk among you in a disorderly manner. Same word, disorderly, unruly manner. Not working at all, but our busybodies. Now, those who are such, we command and exhort through our Lord Jesus Christ that they work in quietness and eat their own bread. For, but as for you, brethren, do not grow weary in doing good. And if anyone does not obey our word in this epistle, note that person, do not keep company with him, that he may be ashamed. Yet don't count him as an enemy, but admonish him, ah, warn him as a brother. And so we have this same kind of a context here. And as believers, we're to step back from those who do not walk orderly. They do not follow Paul's example. They do not follow what Paul had written. In other words, they don't follow the scripture. That's really the heart of the matter. The sense that they were bums is more of a symptom. The, the real problem is their attitude toward the word of God. They aren't following the tradition, the revelation that the Apostle Paul had to give them about how they ought to work. And uh, of course we know how easily that would cure our welfare problem. You know that verse 10 would cure the welfare problem in about 41 days. Right? Anyway, but we won't get political today. Let's move on. Uh, so this idea of unruly, God's word is the cure. God's word is the problem. And they, that's why they're unruly. Going on to back in our context of 1 Thessalonians 5. 1 Thessalonians 5, also in verse 14, he gives us another command. As he said, comfort the faint-hearted. Comfort the faint-hearted. And the sense of comfort meaning to soothe, to calm, to console. This is a real, this is a real tender type word. And the idea of faint-hearted is pretty cool. I, I, I like the word. It's only used here in the scripture, but it's the word for little soul. They have a puny soul. And uh, in the context, this has to do with spirituality. It has to do with, with the, the, spiritual, uh, the spiritual side of things. And so he, he, he says, reach out to these people and, and uh, reach out to them if they're of little soul. I don't know what you envision about little soul. I'm not sure what you might envision about this, but uh, sometimes it was translated despondent. Someone that's despondent. We might say today, we might even use the word depressed today. And all of us can go through situations and cycles in life where, we, where we're down a time or two. But as, how would you reach out to someone who says, well, I'm kind of depressed today. If they're a believer, you know where the place to start? The place to start is a focus on who they are in Christ. You know, the world around us can give us all sorts of labels, all sorts of titles, all sorts of negativity, that if we keep putting that in our mind, it would be natural to be depressed. But considering there's no, if there's no other problem, if if there's no chemical imbalance in things, why not share with that person, why not share with that person of who they are in Christ? 
You know, if we understand, and I want you to turn to Ephesians 1 because I don't know of a better place to get a, get a whole list. But in Ephesians 1, we have a whole list of, of what we have in Christ. And if you remember my statement about what we have in Christ, that it is absolute, that it is irrevocable, that it is unchangeable, that it is eternal. In other words, we're going through a slump because, let's say we lost our job. Just because you're unemployed doesn't mean you're not absolutely you're eternally, irrevocable, and unchangeably a child of God. Let's say you're going through a slump of whatever it might be. It does not change who you are in Christ. And Ephesians 1, and I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I want you to catch some of these. Who does he call them in verse 2? Saints. Saints. You are a saint because you've trusted Jesus Christ. And once you've trusted Jesus Christ, you are a saint eternally. That does not change. No matter how much your halo slips. You're still a saint in God's sight. Uh, you've been, look at verse 4, chosen. Chosen in Christ. Notice the in Him or in Christ. You got that. Chosen. How, how, how long does this last? Eternally. You're predestined. You're adopted as sons. You're placed into the family of God. And that never changes. How often, how often do, you, do you remind your child of that? Your personal child in your home. Hey, you're mine. I know you flubbed here. But you're still my child. The child, your child of God's status does not change because it's in Christ. It's not something you do to get in. It's not something you do to get out. Going on, you're accepted. It's the word for grace. You're accepted in the beloved one. You're redeemed. You're forgiven. How much have you been forgiven? A-L-L. -L. Colossians 2.13. He's forgiven you all trespasses. That's what you have in Christ. That doesn't change based on your behavior, based on your thoughts, based on what... No, I'm a forgiven child of God. I'm an heir of God. That was verse 7. The heir of God goes on a little further. Purposeful, verse 13. Securely sealed with the Holy Spirit. Securely sealed. In other words, the Holy Spirit doesn't come flitting in and out just because you're a good boy or a good girl or a bad girl or a good boy. It doesn't, it doesn't change. These are... These are absolute, irrevocable, unchangeable, and eternal truths about who you are in Christ. Don't let the circumstances of life rob you from that. Don't be little-souled. Don't be a little soul because of the whim of your feelings at the moment. Come back here and get a charge. Get a charge from God that will comfort you, that will bring you back to where you ought to be. Number three in our context back in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 14. Notice how these short little commands. He says, uphold the weak. Well, the word uphold is, is literally to hold against. Now, let me, let me illustrate that if I could have a volunteer. Micah, would you come up here for a minute? Micah wants to get on YouTube. No, <laughs> he really doesn't. I just surprised him with this. But, uh, but uh, what, the sense here is uphold the weak. And the sense is to hold against. Let's just pretend, which leg was broke earlier? It was. Pick it off the ground once. Yeah, all right. So if I'm going to help Micah go down the, go down the road with a broken leg, you know, I might hold him against me. To give him a support. That's what he's saying here. Hold again. Support. Uphold. Uphold to someone who's weak. Wave at you too. Go sit down. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. But I think we get the idea. Now in this situation, in this situation, it is the sense of the weak. It has to be a spiritual weak. A spiritual weak person that, is, that needs to be upheld. 
In Romans chapter 15, he addresses the idea of those that are weak in a spiritual sense, and he says, accept them. I mean, you, if, if, uh, if Micah didn't trust me, if he didn't know I accepted him as my friend and, and etc., he would never come up here. But, but in, in Romans 15, it's that sense of accepting someone, even if they're spiritual weak, even if, they, even if they're not where they ought to be. But as you go down through the passage, it gets to the idea and the end goal is to edify. And I found as I looked at this, looked at this context here, there's this sense of edifying, this sense of building up. Edification is the goal. That's where we ought to be with every believer. Edify them, build them up. They're weak, build them up, give them a charge. The fourth command, point number five, be patient toward all. Patient, long suffering. It's the word macro, macro and anger. Long fused, long fused. And I have to tell you that, that this, this uh, idea is really the basis for ministry. My verse, you know my verse is 2 Timothy 4.2. And if you want to turn there, that's fine. It says, preach the word. And you'd think that a preacher would say, yeah, that's what he ought to be doing, preach the word. But you know, I remember years ago, I don't, know, I don't remember what year it might have been. Several years ago, I was, a, I was the speaker at a Bible camp and we were on a 38-mile hike through the wilderness of Alaska. My boots were, were tearing my feet up. And uh, it started raining. The kids were grumbling about everything. The counselors, were, the counselors were discouraged and down. And uh, I don't know, somehow, shortly before that, I'd been studying or looking at that verse of, of 2 Timothy Check 2 Timothy 4.2. And the Lord really spoke to me about the latter part of that verse, and I was able to bring encouragement into the midst. But I, I remember the setting perfectly. I mean, fire barely going and rain dripping, and you know, when, uh, don't you just love camping? Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, psh, psh, psh. I mean, it was, it was wet. And somehow the kids were over there grumbling, the counselors were over here grumbling. And I, I thought, what am I here for? You know? And I went over to the counselors and I gave them this verse. I said, this is what we're here for. And I don't remember all that I said or anything. It's been too long ago. And I don't know if they'd remember it, but it, it just, it just, this verse just gripped me at that moment saying, this is the answer. And it wasn't the preach the word part. Yeah, that was the point why we were there. That's what I felt my job was, is to preach the word, to share the word, and it goes on and says, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort. And you know how it ends? That it was the ending that got me with all long suffering. Huh. In other words, that's what hit me, and that's what I shared with these guys. And I said, hang in there. That I know I need to be patient with you. If it goes in one ear and out the other. Oh, by the way, did, uh, when Jeremy Clark was here, did he tell that joke publicly about the, the lawyer and the doctor and the preacher all went hunting? Did he tell you that? Oh, I don't know. Maybe he told us. Did he tell us? I don't know. Maybe it was sitting over there eating dinner or something like that. And he said, yeah, these three guys went hunting. Up chucks some deer. Bam, they all shoot. And they go all over there. And there's the dead deer. And, uh, and they're, they don't know who got it. And the farmer came along and he said, huh, the preacher got it. Huh, how do you know? Well, when it, the bullet went in one ear and out the other. <laughs> so I promise, so I promise to be long-suffering with you. I'm not going to hand out earplugs to stop that other ear. See, I'm not going to, no. You know, I think he told me that because of my hunting bag. I don't know where he told that, but anyway. You know, but I promise to be patient with you and allow God to use his... I'm confident that God is going to use his word. 
I am confident. And so when it says to be long-suffering to all, that's what spoke to me. Just that encouragement that, you know, the word's really the answer. And my attitude of being long-suffering is to, is to reach out. And so when it reaches out to all, that includes all. It even includes the unbeliever. I think the focus is on believers here. But I think, I think the, the emphasis, and I think we could also include the idea of the unbeliever. You probably got some unbelievers in your, in your circle some, somewhere along the line, and they, well, maybe they, they irritate you. Somebody comes knocking on your door, and they irritate you because of what they believe and what they're trying to do. Be patient toward all, and the word is the answer. Command number five, see to it in verse 15. See to it that there's no revenge. See to it. How, how do we do this? Some people have thought, well, see to it. That must be talking to the leaders in the church. Well, if we read Ephesians chapter 4 and verses 12 to 16, we know that, that we all are in the ministry. We're all in the ministry. We all have a responsibility to minister to one another, and we're to see to it that no one, no one renders evil for evil. No. What's the bottom line? It's the encouragement to trust the Lord to balance the wrongs. It may not even happen in our lifetime. It may not happen in our lifetime that the wrongs get balanced when someone cheated you, whether it be money, whether it be, whether it be other sorts of things. But God can balance the wrongs. In Romans chapter 12, it's the same kind of a thing, 12, 14 to 19, and he quotes that Psalm 94, or a portion of it, or the idea of it. In Psalm 94, 1, it says, O oh Lord God, to whom vengeance belongs. O oh God, to whom vengeance belongs, shine forth. Now, I don't think we can prove that David wrote Psalm 94, but we, we know that he lived that attitude. When you picture Saul harassing him and trying to kill him like he did, and David wouldn't lay a hand on him except cut his garment off. David wouldn't, David wouldn't harm him. What do you feel like when someone cuts you off in traffic? You know? Number six. Pursue the good. This is in contrast to seeking revenge. Wow. It is in contrast, but I think it can stand alone as well. Pursue is not lackadaisical kind of ho-hum idea. Pursue is intentional. There's the idea of intentionality in the context here. And he says, pursue the good. As I come to this, I want to share a pet peeve of mine with, uh, with how people receive, receive messages. You know, I wish this would go in one ear and out the other a lot of times because sometimes people get the idea that preachers are just saying, now be good. That that's all that the preacher wants everybody to do. Stop your sinning and be good. If you got that out of this message today, slap me on the way out, will you? You know, I mean, it's... No. He, he's saying here... Pursue the good. We've got to let God define the good. And you know, the spiritual life isn't a focus on stopping your sinning. That's where our focus ought not, it ought not be there. Our focus ought to be living for the Lord, walking, walking with the Lord. As uh, Galatians 5.16 says, you walk in the Spirit and you'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. He doesn't say, stop walking in the flesh and you'll be spirit. No. You start on the, you, it's on the positive. Walk in the Spirit. Yield to the Spirit. And these other things fall by the wayside. And so the, the challenge for us, and I, don't, and I don't want to get sidetracked on the idea of, well, just be good. No, he's pursuing the good. You know what the good is? I think we have to go back to let God defining, define it like in Ephesians 2.10. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus. Four good works that God has pre-prepared that we should walk in them. God has a design and a plan. In other words, when he says pursue the good here, it's bigger than, it's greater than being good. 
It's a life in tune with the will and the work of God and the word of God. Pursue the good to one another. That includes in yourself and in others around you. And interestingly, when I was looking at this idea of good and comparing it in other scriptures, I found a clear connection to the idea of edification. If you're going to pursue the good in others, it's going to come out in edification, as it does in Romans 15.2. Romans 15.2, that idea of the weaker brother, it says, please him for his good, i.e. edification. Or in Ephesians 4.29, our mouths are to be used for good, for edification. And how, what is that spelled out as? Speaking grace. Speaking grace or ministering grace. It's all a part of our business of being, of, of the work of the ministry to edify, to build up one another in the Lord. What, what are your pursuits? What are you pursuing? I often ask that of somebody in college. What career are you pursuing? But maybe we ought to be asking, what are you pursuing in our spiritual lives? I hope you noticed in these half a dozen commands that we've given, there's been this common thread of the Word of God. A common thread of the Word of God flows through all of these commands. And as I picture Paul writing these things, I can picture him maybe sitting back and seeing the faces of the Thessalonians, trying to remember these people he only spent a short time with. Thinking about, thinking about, wow, how far they progressed. Yeah, they need some more. But I think I, 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 see him, I see him with a loving heart toward them. Just really wanting them to get the truth. Wanting them to get the truth. And so he says, I exhort you, brother. Come back to the context here with me. And I'm going to read through 14 and 15. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn those that are unruly, comfort the faint-hearted, uphold the weak, be patient with all, see that no one renders evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good, both for yourselves and for all. Would this type of an encouragement connected to these commands, would that give you a sense of urgency, that sense to expedite what God has given us here? Expedite the encouragement. Our Father in heaven, thank you for your word. We thank you that it can speak to us, be it lengthy passages or short passages. We pray that that it just might touch our hearts and move us, that we might live for you in recognition that Jesus is coming. Thank you, Father, for your truth. In Christ's name, amen.